Okay, welcome back. My God, this is loud. I have the power. Uh, uh, next up, we've got Stephen Stenneker talking about MongoDB replication and replication and replica sets. Cool. Can we hear me? Yes. Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, so my name is uh, Stephen. I'm actually a software developer and sysadmin. Um, and currently, I'm a support engineer at Tengen Australia. Um, so you may or may not know, but Tengen is the company that uh, develops MongoDB. Uh, it's a New York-based company, but we have an office in Sydney, or have had an office in Sydney for the last seven months now. Um, so I'm going to talk to you basically an introduction to replication and replica sets, because there's a lot of details we can go into. Um, so um, if you have any questions, uh, just fire away. Um, so the agenda here is going to talk about the replica set lifecycle. So basically, what does it look like? What is it? Um, a little bit about developing with replica sets, and then some operating considerations. Um, so first of all, uh, how many of you are actually using MongoDB at the moment? A show of hands, yes? And how many are using it in production? Cool. OK, so um, and have, has everyone heard of MongoDB? Do you know what it is? OK, so MongoDB is a, a document-oriented NoSQL database. Um, basically, uh, it's optimized for performance, so um, performance and high availability. So what we're talking about today is replication, which is uh, specifically a feature for availability and data redundancy. Um, so why do you use replication? Basically, replication has a number of different benefits, but um, and basically, you know, how many of you have actually woken up and you've had a server and it's fallen over? Um, how many of you have actually woken up and actually found out that you have to manually fail over from a from a slave to a master because there is no automatic um, failover. Um, if you have issues due to network latency or, um, uh, or hardware problems, uh, that's also a common, common thing which replication can address. And basically, there's different uses for, um, for replication. So you can use it for just for normal uh, processing of data. So maybe you want to um, have your data and you want to run um, analytics jobs. You want to run your analytics jobs without impacting the performance of your production. Writes. So your analytics jobs are predominantly read jobs, so you would run those off of a secondary in your replica set as opposed to taking down uh, or affecting the performance of your primary. So basically, this is the replica set lifecycle. Um, the, the minimum replica set that you have, uh, well, you could actually have a replica set, which is one node, but that doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Um, so the general uh, minimal, recommend, minimal recommend replica set is a um, three-node set. And this is basically... Um, it works on a, a primary, sorry, it works on a quorum uh, basis, which means that we have uh, three nodes. If you have three nodes, you need to have at least um, half of the nodes available. So two, half. So if you had a three-node replica set, you'd have to have two nodes available in order to elect a new primary. Uh, when you create a replica set, um, this is what it looks like. So you have a primary. Um, you have one or more secondaries, which replicate from the primary. Um, and you have a heartbeat between all the nodes. And the heartbeat basically makes sure that the nodes are actually available. So in the event that one of the nodes um, has an issue, so it fails to respond to the heartbeat, there's a certain delay. We'll actually look at it and um, decide whether the node is actually down or not. And at that point, the node will actually fail. And it'll fail out of the replica set. Um, and there will be an election. And the way the election works is it basically um, looks at the nodes that are currently available in the replica set. And decide which of the nodes is most up to date. Um, is there a majority of the nodes uh, visible? And then elects a new prime. So when we fail over here, uh, we've got a node that's failed. The two secondaries will have an election between themselves. And then a new primary will be elected. So this happens automatically. This is um, basically uh, auto failover. Uh, in a replica set, there's a single master in MongoDB. So basically, it's just a, a primary and then multiple slaves off the primary. Um, when the, uh, the node that's failed comes back or returns, uh, it will automatically reconnect to the replica set. It will determine which node it can actually sync from. If the node is actually still has um, a current amount of data on it, basically it can still rejoin the replica set and it hasn't um, fallen too far behind, then it'll, it'll basically start resume syncing from where it was previously. Um, if the node falls too far behind and can no longer sync with the replica set, then it'll actually do a full resync from the, uh, from the primary or the, uh, the nearest node. So once the node recovers, then the, it'll actually um, resume its role as a secondary, and uh, replication will continue. 
So let me know if I'm going too fast here, because I'm actually trying to cover a fair bit of things. So um, I'm going to look here now at the actual replica set rules. So in a replica set, a typical replica set, um, you've got three main rules um, that you can have. First note is the primary. The primary is the, the master, where you can write. Uh, you can only write to the primary, and those writes are then replicated to the other nodes. A secondary is a data-bearing node. So secondary is basically a node that's available for, um, for reading. Uh, you can't write to a secondary directly. Um, and you can have different configuration op options for secondary. So if you want to have a secondary which is, um, has a delay or perhaps is hidden, so you only use it for certain uses, um, you can do that as well. And the third type of node here is an arbiter. And an arbiter is a non-data-bearing node. An arbiter is basically a node that exists in order to, um, to vote in elections. So if you have, um, the reason that we have, uh, actually, I should have backed up a bit. Uh, in a replica set, generally, you need to have an odd number of nodes. And this is basically to avoid um, net splits when you have a quorum. So to have a quorum when you have a net split. So if you have three nodes, um, and any one of those nodes is down, the other remaining two nodes can still vote and say, we have a majority of the replica set visible, uh, so we can elect a new primary. If you only have two nodes, and the network between the two nodes gets disconnected, then basically both the nodes could try and declare themselves primary, and um, that would be a bad thing. So in MongoDB, you can only have, uh, you need to have a quorum available to the replica set enabled in order to um, elect a new primary. Um, so the arbiter is basically there as a non-data-bearing node that can act as a tiebreaker. So if you don't want to um, have another server provisioned, which is a full data-bearing node, you can set up an arbiter for that. So this is a configuration file which shows um, well, one sort of deployment. So basically, in this configuration, uh, we've got a replica set which has five nodes. Um, with five nodes, that means that you can have uh, up to two nodes not available, generally, and still be able to maintain a quorum in the replica set uh, without having to uh, manually intervene. Um, so I'm going to walk through the different um, configuration options that we have here. But basically, this, each of the five servers is configured slightly differently for a specific purpose. Uh, you'll see that each host has an ID. The ID is a numeric ID, which is automatically assigned when you add it into the replica set. This is basically an incrementing uh, floating point number. Sorry, in incrementing number, uh, which um, uniquely identifies that host. So if you actually took the host down and rejoined the replica set, uh, you would actually still have the same ID number. If you physically removed the host and re-added it, you would end up with a new ID number. So when you start off, uh, the nodes are going to be sequential. So they go from 0 to however many nodes you have. But eventually, you may have gaps in the IDs, which is fine. Uh, there's a few different properties you can set. So this is basically uh, the configuration is the JSON configuration. Um, so for each member of the replica set, you've got an ID, which uniquely identifies that member. You've got a host name, which would normally actually be the DNS name. And uh, you have a few different options, such as priority and hidden. So in this configuration, uh, I've got multiple data centers. In my first data center, uh, I've got these two nodes. The priority is going to take effect during elections, which means um, during an election, the node with the highest available priority is the one that's likely to be, or that will be elected as, um, as the primary. So in this case, I I'm encouraging votes to go to, to host A if it's available. If it's not available, the next most important node that I've nominated here is my host B. Uh, in a secondary data center, I've got another node. And this is just the default priority, which is 1. So in general, I don't want to have my node in the secondary data center elected unless the first data center actually fails. So if uh, hosts A and B aren't available, then I'm happy for C to be elected. But in general, I, I want that to be a lower priority. Uh, host number D, this is actually, um, I've got a host which is hidden. So a hidden host is one which uh, doesn't um, normally, if you, if you connect a replica set, you um, can read from secondaries. A hidden one is one that can only be read from if you connect to it directly. So the reason for doing that is you can have a hidden node which could be used for analytics. So you may want to run map reduces or different queries against your, your hidden node without, affecting, um, without having it in the regular pool. Um, the last node here is actually a backup node. And the backup node here has a delay on it. So the delay means that it's actually going to be running 3,600 um, uh, seconds behind. So it's going to be, basically, I've got an hour delay. So if I accidentally delete something or do something terrible on 
the primary, I've actually got an hour's window to actually go back and recover that from the, uh, the backup node. Uh, so what does that look like when you're developing with replica sets? So basically we have a number of different options for um, depending on what level of consistency you want to get from your application. So this is really something that you control as the application developer. So if you want strong consistency, then um, you read and write to the primary, and the secondaries are only used in replication. So in this model here, uh, basically if I write something to the primary and I use the same connection, I can then read the same information back. So it's basically read after write consistency. Um, if you're actually okay with um, eventual consistency or delayed consistency, you can actually have a read preference that says you're okay to read from a secondary and you can write to the primary. This may or may not be a good thing depending on your application characteristics uh, for performance because the secondary still have to replicate all the operations from the primary. So reading from a secondary may not necessarily um, speed up the performance of your application. The, the main uh, reason for doing this would, would be um, it does take some load off the primary. And perhaps in the secondaries, you're actually reading different data from the data set that you write. So uh, if you're actually working with um, data on the secondary that's older data and you're loading that into memory, you maybe don't want to load that into memory in the primary. Um, so the right concern is uh, what you specify when you connect to the replica set. And you can basically say, this is the level of um, write acknowledgement that you want to get. And you can control that depending on what level of consistency uh, you care about in your application. So the default up until recently uh, for MongoDB was actually do unacknowledged writes, which means you basically fire it off to the database. Um, it will get committed, but you're not waiting for an answer back to see if there, was an, if there was an error for it. So in some cases, you may actually, you could lose some data for that, which is basically called like a fire and forget concern. Uh, recently, we've changed that in the drivers. So now the default is, um, is uh, acknowledgement, which is wait for error. So what this means is, uh, after every update, it'll actually set a flag and, and wait to see if there was actually an error when that data was committed. Uh, the way that uh, MongoDB works architecturally is that um, we use memory mapped I.O. So when you actually commit the data, the data is written first to memory. Uh, it actually gets written into a journal file, and then the journal file gets applied to, the, to um, storage. So there's several steps there uh, in terms of when the data is actually committed. So you can also say, uh, set a higher level of write concern, which says you want to wait for journal sync, which means you get an acknowledgement back once that data has been applied to memory and also been applied to the journal. Um, and you can also set a flag which says, I want it to be replicated to uh, a certain number of hosts. So you could say, I want a, a write concern of two. It must be committed to at least two other nodes aside from the primary in order to, um, to acknowledge the, the commit. Uh, we added another feature in, in MongoDB 2.0 um, called tagging. And tagging actually gives you even more control over that, where you can actually add tags to your hosts. So you can say, this node is a data center in Sydney, uh, or you can get it down to specifics of, this is a data center in Sydney, rack number three. And then you can actually use those tags to, um, for uh, both reading and for write preferences. So those rules can actually change without changing your application code. Uh, your administrator can change the rules uh, by tagging the replica set servers. So an example of tagging is um, we've got our four, uh, five nodes again in the replica set. Two of the nodes, the first two nodes are in New York. The second two nodes are tagged as San Francisco data center. And the, uh, the last one is just tagged as mystically cloud. And then um, you can set error modes for that. So uh, we can set a preference called all DCs. And so this is a custom tagging that, that um, we've set up in the configuration. If we say all DCs, this means that when you commit the data, you want to get acknowledgement that's been committed to three data centers. So that's based on the tags. So three data centers here would mean it would have to be committed to New York, San Francisco, and the cloud. Uh, there's another example there of some DCs, which just says the data must be committed to at least two data centers. So what does that look like? Um, basically, waiting for replication. Uh, if you actually set a right concern of of one, then it's going to go to the primary data center. Right concern of two, it's going to go to the secondary. Right concern of three, then it's going to write to the primary, secondary, and the cloud. And obviously, the more uh, acknowledgement you need in the right, the longer you're going to have in terms of a delay uh, on your insertions. So um, you can also do uh, read preferences. So read preferences are saying where you want to read the data from. So the default is to read from the primary, uh, to only read from the primary. 
Uh, you can also set a read preference of primary preferred, which means uh, you prefer to read from the, from the primary if it is available, but a secondary is okay. Uh, there's a read preferences of secondary okay, which is, um, or secondary, which is only read from a secondary. And there's a read preference of secondary preferred, which is, uh, is I want to read from a secondary unless it's not available. And the last read preference is nearest, which is read from the nearest uh, server by ping time. Um, and you can also set up custom read preferences so you could actually tag your nodes and say this is a node for analytics or for um, SSD and then use those preferences to read from the specific uh, nodes of interest. Uh, so operational considerations. Uh, the, uh, the general intent of replica sets is to allow you to operate with no downtime. So basically there's automatic failover. If one of the nodes goes down, then uh, another node should automatically step up, assuming you still have a majority of a replica set available. Uh, the other, uh, another very useful feature of replica sets is to use them for maintenance. So if you actually had five nodes in replica set, you could take down one or two nodes, uh, do a repair or, or you know, disk expansion or something on, on the node while it's out of the replica set, and then bring it back up without interrupting your application. So the application drivers will automatically take care of, of failing over to, uh, based on the replica set configuration. So your application connects to the replica set um, as a uh, as an entity and doesn't actually concern itself with the details of what hosts are currently available. Um, so here's a few different configurations. So basically, configuration number one is a single data center. So basically, we've got three nodes in a data center. Um, and these could be a, a primary and a secondary and a arbiter, or it could be a primary and two secondaries. But you've got a single data center, single switch, a single point of failure, well, multiple single points of failure. Uh, if any one of the nodes crashes, then um, the replica set will still remain available. So basically you've got, uh, you're allowed one node to crash. Um, expanding the scenario to, to two data centers, uh, we could actually have two nodes in one data center and one node in the other. Uh, in this case, you know, the node in the other data center is there as an example for safety or disaster recovery. So in the event that the data center number one failed completely, there aren't enough nodes in data center number two to actually fail over, but you do have a copy of your data. In the event the data center two failed, then data center number one is still going to be fine. And this example here is with three data centers. So basically you can f survive a full data center loss in this scenario. So you know, each of the data centers has, um, is, has enough nodes to be able to maintain a quorum. As long as any two data centers are up, sorry. <laughs> Um, and you can add a write concern here, so you can say write concern to two data centers to guarantee that the data has been written to, um, to at least two data centers. And right, so that's kind of the speed tour, and basically the conclusion is just use it. Um, it's really easy to set up, you can actually try it on a single machine, and uh, there's lots of tutorials and information on that. And um, I think I have a few minutes for questions. Yes? In the typical cluster setup I'm used to with MySQL, for example, we use a virtual IP which is controlled by some other software which plays between us depending on what node's primary. I know you never spoke about any of that with MongoDB, so I assume it's done in the driver on the client, end, correct? Yeah, so we actually have our own heartbeat in the replica set, so you wouldn't be, normally wouldn't be using uh, that sort of failover. To the right, yeah, I think they're, they're a useful tool in replica set configuration. I think ideally, you know, I would personally feel better about having secondaries so you have more copies of the data. But you know, in the event where you actually just want to have an extra node as a, uh, in order to maintain the, uh, the quorum for your replica set, or if you want to get something up in a hurry and have uh, just spin up an arbiter rather than having a full secondary available, then they're a useful part of the, uh, of the deployment. So I, I understand that Um, they're, they're a hassle. 
to work with. I, I don't know if they're a hassle necessarily, but one thing that does confuse people is the name. So Arbitrus makes it sound like it's much more important than it is. It's really just a, a node that doesn't have data on it that is able to vote. So, yeah. Any other takers? So, so what happens with the acknowledgement if you haven't asked for it? Or? So, so if you've got the acknowledgement comes through the system, yep. um, thanks. It, when the acknowledgement comes through the system, uh, what, what happens to the data uh, once, but until it reaches or receives that acknowledgement? And then what's the strategy if it doesn't actually get the acknowledgement, if it uh, doesn't you know, replicate or something? So basically, that, that acknowledgement is something which is propagating the error back to the driver. So you know, the normal strategy is data gets immediately committed in memory. It gets committed to a journal, which by default is every 100 milliseconds is getting flushed to disk. So it's basically an append-only uh, journal. And then that journal uh, periodically is getting synced to permanent storage. So the default for that is every 60 seconds, it'll flush to or sync the, um, that to disk. So, so that will resync if there's a, uh, an error and it doesn't actually come through? If there's an error, then it's, it's up to the driver. To, so your application would have to handle that error. So if the data didn't get inserted, or depending on what the error is, could be a duplicate key or some other error aside from. Generally, the error is, is something to do with constraint, like, or with a duplicate key or another exception that occurs. Okay, I was thinking more in terms of saying there's a, a communications and network error or something like that. The replication fails. You've said that uh, I, I want that you've added the tag yep. uh, to, to actually. So the acknowledgement is something that you've asked for. So, you're, you're, so your, your application is going to get back and say there was an exception. And then your application has to decide how to handle that. So, yeah. so the, the data may have been committed. It depends what the actual exception you get is. But it's something you have to handle at the application level to decide, do you want to retry that, or is, is, you know, what do you do with that? You could also say continue on error. I mean, you, you basically, it's an application level control for that. Last one. In that case, thank you, Stephen. <laughs>